So a couple of years ago, uh, actually right around the time I, I got the manuscript done for the book, uh, I saw this great movie called The Last Rites of Joe May. And it starred Dennis Farina as Joe May, this um, uh, kind of hoodlum down on his luck. And uh, filmed in Chicago, a nice little, nice little slice of life movie. Uh, probably, probably his last film or pretty close to it uh, for Dennis Farina, a Chicago born actor. And there's one scene when he comes out of the hospital towards the beginning of the movie. And he comes out of the hospital and he goes back to his old apartment on the north side and he finds out there's a woman living in his apartment, that the apartment has been rented to someone else. So he um, calls the landlord and the landlord calls him back and they meet in the woman's apartment. And the, and the landlord is really apologetic. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't know, you know, you're in the hospital for so long, I didn't know if you'd come back. He says, I tell you what, um, I can get you an apartment, on, I can get you an apartment on the south side. And Joe May, Dennis Freeno, that great face, that great voice, he says, who the heck, I mean, he doesn't say heck, who the heck wants to live on the south side? And of course, you know, I shook my fist at the screen and had trouble watching the rest of it for a little while. But, but, what, but, what, but what Dennis Farina said, what his line, Joe May's line um, uh, embodied, was a certain uh, attitude uh, that we have about the South Side of Chicago, um, across the city and indeed across the country, that it's a place to avoid. Who wants to live on the South Side of Chicago? Um, and that's largely because we've been fed a narrative about the South Side and, to the West, and about the West Side as well of disinvestment. <clears throat> disinvestment, crime, the whole thing. It's a place to avoid, stay away from, don't go there. And uh, I was born on the South Side, still live on the, on the South Side in the Pullman community. And um, the purpose of Southern Exposure uh, was to add another layer to that story of the South Side. To say that um, alongside the narratives that, that you've heard, uh, there's also this fantastic history uh, architectural history, urban planning history, uh, that informs the South Side, and that the best buildings in the city, outside of downtown, are actually on the South Side of Chicago, and then through photography and words uh, begin to show that. But then, um, the book also, my intent, was to also address those issues on the South Side, the disinvestment uh, especially, and to show that it isn't just a case of black and brown people moving to an area and ruining it, ruining it, which is often a story that's told, but there are very systematic things that have happened over the past 100 years of a black presence on the South Side, from redlining to uh, banks not making home loans, to industry moving away, to policy, to all the kind of things that you'll see in the book that helped shape some of the conditions that we see on the South Side. Then the book doubles back again and says, but even when you know all that, what you really don't know is that there are miles and miles and miles and miles of fantastic and intact neighborhoods uh, filled with people who are pushing against the negativity that's happening to them, the economic violence, if you will, that's happening to them, uh, to maintain the buildings uh, that you see in the, um, in, in, in the book. And then wrapped around all that is a bit of a memoir, it starts off with um, a story of my father, my late father, uh, taking me on a ride through Bronzeville when I was 15 and um, how 14, I, I guess I was still, was still, still was 14. And how that ride through Bronzeville, which is the neighborhood where he grew up and, and how uh, the, the places that he showed me and the buildings that he showed me um, ended up being, you know, 15 years later, the basis for some of my first stories as architecture critic for the Sun-Times, looking back at the Bronzeville community and calling for it to be saved, uh, or to, to be preserved, it was already saved, uh, for the city to step up its efforts to preserve it and grant landmark status and invest in this neighborhood, uh, this series of, series of neighborhoods, the same way it had done and was doing uh, in the 90s uh, to parts of the north side and the near west side as well. Uh, so with that, um, I think I want to go share my screen with you and show you some of the images from the book. Let's see here. All right. So of course, this is the cover of the book, uh, Patrick showed. And, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the, um, the, the cover, of course, is if you know, if you know the University of Chicago, this is the D'Angelo Law Library uh, on the south 
east corner of the campus uh, on the other side of the Midway Plaisance, um, building by, designed by Errol Saarinen, um, uh, 1959, just a great structure, that Bedford limestone base, that, uh, that folded glass accordion box uh, that sits above it, uh, the reflecting pool in the front, and even then, it's a, it's a building that often gets overlooked because it sits so far back from the street. Uh, it's on 60th, I suppose, but it sits so far back, it's probably closer to 61st, the back end of the building, uh, than it is to, uh, to the front. But just a great um, and surprising building there on the, on the campus. Uh, the decision was made by um, the, the book's design editor uh, to uh, use this one for the cover. I wanted Pride Cleaners, which is a building you're gonna see in a few seconds. Uh, but what was cool about it, uh, her picking this, is I really think that she, uh, Marianne Jankowski, I think she really wants to play with the title, where it says Southern Exposure and have it reflect in the, uh, in the water there. So it's, it's been very good for us uh, as, a, as a cover. And, uh, and oh, I should also say that Amanda Williams, a uh, Chicago artist, um, fantastic Chicago artist, um, who's been exhibited, of course, here, but also at the Venice Biennale and the Chicago Architecture Biennial and other points and places throughout the globe, um, also, she's a daughter of the South Side, like I'm a son of the South Side, and we've known each other for, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years, and I wanted her to write the foreword to the book, and um, for those of you who will get your hands on the book or have, or have seen it already, I'm not afraid to say that Amanda's foreword uh, is as good as the book. I mean, the pictures on the foreword, um, if you can deal with that, you, you're, you're good. That's the whole meal right there, um, but this was the first foreword that she wrote. Uh, I think she was a little nervous, but it's a winner. It's, it, it sets the stage perfectly uh, for the pages to follow. Um, two images that I should have put in the book and didn't, but this is my father uh, in the white t-shirt. This is the original Lee Bay, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as I like to say, and that's me on the, on the horse. Uh, this is the Christmas of 1966. I was born the year before, and um, the, 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 the family lore is my father has given me a drink of beer uh, in his hand there, and my mother took the picture. So they're, you know, they're just as bad as I am in terms of being able to do impish things with, with, uh, with, uh, with kids. But um, in that image, there's a lot of things that I like, right? I do like a beer now and again. And uh, there's a coffee pot to the left. I love coffee. Uh, there are Paul Mall cigarettes. I don't smoke those, but there's a mid-century chair that the old man is sitting in. And... Um, and, and also the architecture, the love of architecture and cities that he, and my father worked for Reynolds Aluminum, Reynolds Metals Company in McCook, Illinois, was not, you know, he like me was, didn't come to architecture, away from architecture lettered in any way. Uh, he was a layman like I am, and like many of us are, who just had an appreciation for the built environment and, and the city. And kind of, as you'll see in the book, introduced me to it on the sly uh, over, the, over the years. The next picture is same uh, Christmas, uh, same outfit that I'm wearing. This is my uh, this is my late mother Lula, and through her, uh, I get a love of art, uh, movies especially, and um, just a, a sort of a, a sense of observation. And so I, I like to begin these lectures now with them because none of what you will see or hear or anything I've become or will become that's good uh, would have been possible without without them. Now to get to this to get to the tour. Here we are, 79th and St. Lawrence. This is Pride Cleaners, as depicted in the book. Um, built in 1959, designed by Gerald Seward, a Chicago architect, that not a lot is, has been known about. One of the things about this book has been, you know, going through uh, newspaper clippings now online, thankfully, and, and books and things to kind of stitch together the histories of the people and the places that they created. Uh, so this building comes along in 1959, uh, Chatham, the Chatham neighborhood, as you can see from the houses on the right, is a pretty traditional neighborhood in, in a sense, much of it is built before World War II. And then, you know, there's a lull with the war and of course the depression leading up to the war. And then after that, in the 50s, the city begins to come alive again. And we see that expressed with modernist architecture downtown, the, Steel and glass boxes by Skidmore Owings and Merrill and Mies van der Rohe and Perkins and Will. But out in the neighborhoods and out in the suburbs here and there, uh, you can find some spectacular, you know, kind of middle brow modernism, if you will. And this is my favorite. 
So it's a hyperbolic, that is a hyperbolic paraboloid roof, self-supporting concrete roof fortified with rebar uh, in it, uh, you know, sandwiched in, in between. And it allows the building, it allows the roof to hold up all by itself. That's kind of important in a way uh, with the dry cleaners, which this is because it's chock full of, you know, clothes and equipment and workers. So you don't, you want to have the interior as obstruction free as possible. Um, it's also about to the space age, right? And the jet age, which are upon us by 1959 and begins to inform architecture and language and even car design. You can see, um, you know, Cadillacs and others with tail fins that look much like this, this building. Uh, when I took this photograph in 2018, uh, I was really concerned about the future of it. It is not a city landmark, despite being one of the most striking buildings you'll ever see in Chicago. And um, the owner, the good thing about it was is that he didn't muck up the building, right? Um, he, there, there isn't an 80s remodeling that would have ruined it or, or a 90s remodeling uh, that would have added, you know, postmodern elements to it. He left it alone, which is good. But the bad part about it is, is that he didn't, he didn't invest much money into it. So you wondered what was going to happen. Um, this, the owner at the time I took this photograph, though, did one great thing that was smart. He sold it. He put it for sale. And he sold it, he marketed it as a business opportunity. So some part of him did not want this building to be torn down. He, so he's telling people, if you buy this building, you're buying a business. And now uh, a young man from, I think he's West Indian, from the West Indies, has bought it. Young guy, I mean, to, to look at him, um, I'm guessing he must, he might not be 40 yet, he's about 40. And he's really gotten into this building, right? So he's, he's painted it, he's replaced that board over the window, he's put streamers around it. Uh, we're going to see the sign, the pride cleaner sign in a few minutes. He's, he wants to restore that. And, you know, it's just proof positive that if you let buildings hang around long enough, you don't destroy them, you don't muck them up, you don't demolish them, that sooner or later, in, in many cases, um, the right owner comes along. Uh, just as pride cleaners was a kind of a disruption of the otherwise historic pre-war Chatham neighborhood, uh, so is this building. This is... Um, this is now GN Bank, uh, owned by a Ghanaian family. Uh, but it was originally uh, Illinois, Service, or Illinois Service Federal Savings and Loan, Black-owned savings and loan, African-American-owned savings and loan, that was started in the neighborhood at, a, at another location, actually the, the old Rosenwald Apartments, which are in the book, but not in this presentation. And by the 1960s, early 1960s, with enough weight and money and prestige, they built this spectacular modernist building at uh, 46 and King Drive on the east side of the street. Uh, but it is perfectly maintained, you know, uh, you know, element of the era. Uh, you know, you look at the, uh, the, the, uh, the bushes, the, the topiary in, in front, they still, you know, cut in that same geometric way they used to do bushes back then. The inside, and um, I wanted to have a book signing here, but the, the coronavirus, you know, shut everything down. But the inside looks like, as I've said before, it looks like where Don Draper would have kept his money in Mad Men. Just a perfect, uh, you know, early 60s interior uh, still preserved. Uh, this building is not a landmark. And, you know, there's no plans to tear it down. I think the family, the Ghanaian family that owns it really wants to do right by this building and another location or two they have on the south side. Uh, but, you know, if development pressures over the next, I don't know, five, ten years uh, on King Drive, which is, a, you know, a stately street boulevard, um, get uh, heavy enough uh, or a new owner, another owner uh, begins to own this building, you, you wonder about a building like this. But for now, it's safe and it's worth looking at. So 46 and King Drive, you all, if you want to go by there and see. Um, here is um, the, the story of Southside Architecture. <clears throat> the, the book wanted to make the case, I wanted to make the case in the book, I should say, that the story continues. It isn't just a place trapped in amber, right, where it's just buildings before, just after the war, in 18, buildings of the 1800s, that the tradition um, of great architecture on the South Side still continues. And this building is the Comer Youth Center, Gary Comer Youth Center, at 72nd and South Chicago. South Chicago is the major street that's running right in front of us on the angle. Uh, Gary Comer, you guys might remember, was the, um, the founder and owner of Land's End, the uh, clothing, uh, the outdoor, you know, adventure clothier uh, that ended up being bought, I think, by Sears 
in the later years. And Gary Comer, a uh, white guy, was born in this neighborhood in around 1930. And uh, the neighborhood experiences, uh, you know, white flight uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, maybe even a little bit before. And, but Gary Comer never forgot his old neighborhood. So quietly, over the decades, uh, you know, he helped, he used his, his uh, vast resources to help, um, uh, you know, uh, to, help, to, help, to help certain needs in the neighborhood, you know, um, computers for the schools, you know, and I think even a new doors for the schools when the Board of Education at one point wouldn't pay for them. So later on in his life, as he begins to, he has cancer. So later on in his life, around 2000, uh, eight, nine, ten, or so, he commissions this building, the Gary Comer Youth Center, designed by John Ronan, a uh, Chicago ar architect. And what's interesting about this is that, of course, the color, look at it, you know, uh, you know the kind of the various colors of values of red on the one side and blue on the other, uh, the form of the building. But what's interesting about this building is that, of course, it's a community center, and it's in the neighborhood that has had its troubles. I wasn't born far from here, actually. I was born 73rd and Kimbark. That's the kitchen that we're standing in, my parents and I, which might be six blocks from here, uh, if that. And usually what happens is when buildings like this, community centers, are built in neighborhoods like this, particularly Black neighborhoods like this, they traditionally look like bunkers, right? They're brick, they're port, they're concrete. Um, they look like a fist to the community. The idea being that um, you know you come inside, you play basketball, you you learn a craft, uh, and you get out, but you don't hang around outside because that's trouble, and uh, and certainly the neighborhood isn't deserving of a better gesture architecturally, uh, and according to that thought. And what happens here is that the neighbors, the residents, the architects, and Comer himself went out of their way to do things differently here and build a building that's really a, a a center of the neighborhood. So inside, there's everything. I've lost track over the years of what's in here, but there is a, a there's a cafeteria. There's a um, there's a there's an auditorium space, a gymnasium space. I think that doubles as an auditorium. There there's recording studios and classroom spaces and a rooftop garden, and it lights up beautifully at night. And the and 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 the neighbors love this building. I photographed it over the years, and I always meet someone, um, either a kid who's who's here or a parent or someone from down the block who's just glad that it's here and, and respects that, 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 it's, that, that it's there. What's interesting about what John Ronan did, though, is that there were concerns about safety. Um, you know, who can look inside the building and w w what, what gang um, score might, need, might, have, might be settled in some violent way uh, by the building. So the building, like the ugly predecessors that I mentioned, does harden itself up at that lower level. I mean, those, um, those glass slits are bullet resistant. Um, and, and so there's a sense that there's, a, that there's a reality of the neighborhood that they live in that the building has to address, but it addresses that reality with dignity and respect for those who live there. Uh, this is out where I, where I am. This is the Method Soap Factory uh, at 111th Street, uh, just west of the Bishop Ford Expressway, if you know the Bishop Ford Expressway. Um, in, the, in the Pullman neighborhood. Now, this tract of land, as well as many of them, acres and acres that are connected to this, behind this building and beyond this building, uh, you know, were, are, were old brown fields, right? You know, when the steel industry dried up in the Calumet area in the 70s and 80s, these places were, were left fallow. Um, there's a group that's based here in Pullman called Chicago Neighborhood Initiatives that uh, has done a fantastic job of acquiring and reprogramming these places. There's a far further, further north, which would be behind this building uh, and a few, maybe a three blocks or four blocks further behind this building. There's a, there's an athletic center that's as first class as anything. You can play baseball in that thing. It's, it's, it's so, it's so large. Uh, basketball, other kind of things, beautiful first class facility. Uh, and here it is, Method Soap. Method Soap is a, as you, if you use it, it's a green company, right? And uh, they embody that, that greenness, that respect for the environment with the architecture of the building. So as you can see to the left, there are solar panels and wind turbines. Um, that um, green space that's to the right is a large, and I mean large, it goes back maybe, I mean, I, it must be two blocks wide and um, you know, from left to right uh, and you know, as deep uh, behind us. But it's, it's a bioswale. 
And what it is, it's natural plantings um, planted there that allows rainwater to release itself, not in our sewers, uh, but, but to retain it on the site and release it slowly back into the ground. Inside, it's a colorful factory. I mean, if you know factories of, the, of old, they look like dangerous places. This is a beautiful, colorful place on the inside and really an asset to the, to the neighborhood and a jobs provider to the neighborhood. Uh, we're, we're back again at the, um, at the library. The only thing I can say about this is new that I didn't say before is that you can see, I don't think I noticed that, dead center, there's a cow from the old Cows on Parade. Remember that? The Cows on Parade, those things were all over the city about 20 years ago. Um, but um, this building is not a landmark, not in danger uh, in any, in it, and also, uh, but it's just a, a fantastic piece of architecture. Barack Obama uh, practiced constitutional, or taught constitutional law here. Um, and, uh, you know, great building. So we, we talked about that a bit. Now we're back to Pride Cleaners because I wanted to show you this sign. Look at this sign, right? Now, it, 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 it doesn't work now. They don't turn it on now. Uh, but this sign, obviously, it, it uh, has these twinkling lights that would twinkle in procession. Um, a friend of mine who's a sign expert of, of old signs believes that the square there on the sign that says shirts laundered, that likely when the sign was new and there, were, there was neon script inside there, that that part probably revolved, probably turned as the things, as the things twinkled. But just a great sign. And luckily, the new owner appreciates the sign. He loves the sign. He and I talked last summer, uh, summer of 2019. And um, I hooked him up with some contacts in the city's planning department, the Landmarks Division, because he wants to find the right person who can restore that sign. So um, just, a, just a great thing. Looks like it should, as I say in the book, um, that sign looks like it should tell you that, um, that Sammy Davis Jr. and Frank Sinatra are going to be at the Sands tonight, rather than telling you you can get your shirt clean for two bucks. But but that's just the beauty of the building. Uh, this is uh, the auditorium of Chicago Vocational High School, 2100 East 87th Street. Now, most people, if they see this building at all, Chicagoans, they see it when they're leaving town on the Skyway. And when I was at the Sun-Times, I would often get people calling me, what is that warehouse, that giant warehouse down there? And I would say, now, no, not a warehouse, it's a school, second largest school in Chicago, and it's worth, as I say in the book, getting off the Skyway and taking a good look uh, around. So this is the auditorium entrance. Um, CVS, Chicago Vocational High School, was built in 1941, and it was obviously a vocational high school um, that was designed to, the, 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 the founders of the school, the, the public, um, the, the school board, uh, and the leaders of the city saw the 20th century as one that was mechanized, right, correctly, where there was air conditioners to, to repair and fix and make it, cars to fix and all kinds of things. And this was the place to learn. It was a way to, particularly on the southeast side of Chicago, which already had an industrial base, um, this was a great, great way to keep people who lived here um, employed. Uh, but, but they also did it with a great, they also used great architecture uh, to stitch this together. So what I like about this auditorium is that, again, it's on the west, the west end of the building. And then, and then CVS unfurls eastward, which would be to our right, you know, maybe two blocks or very close to two blocks down 87th Street, set back from the street. And then at the other end, there's the auditorium, there's the athletic, uh, there's a gymnasium, which matches the auditorium. By the way, the auditorium is named now for Bernie Mac, the comedian who was um, class of 76. So, uh, so, they, so it, you roll down 87th Street for, you know, for uh, a block and three quarters or two, and then you meet this place at the other end. Now, I, as I've mentioned in the book, I'm an alum of CVS, class of 83. And, you know, it felt good on gym days to go in and out, the on warm days to go in and out of those columns. It felt like a, like a Roman, like a Greek athlete going to, going to competition. But just interesting that in this school, you can look to the left and see um, elements of, of, uh, of the school's architecture. And then, and then behind uh, this building, there's a wing down Anthony, which is a diagonal street, which is just a series of shops, um, you know, uh, locational shops. They each look like little factories. Beautiful thing. Now, what's, what's interesting about this building is, is that it was built for 4,000 students. Something like 3,500 went there when I was there uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. Now, something like, like 800 students, only 800 students go here now. And there is fear that, and, and you know, much of the school is closed off and walled off. And there is fear that with a, a school that's, uh, you know, four times larger 
uh, than its population, almost five times larger than its population, current population, that these wings are going to be demolished. And, and this building is not a landmark, and it certainly should be, given the, um, the, uh, the notable people who went there, the, the notable architecture that, 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 that the building is, um, uh, the people who attended there, the students, the graduates, and the notable architecture that it is, it's certainly worthy of landmark status. So the book calls for it, and there's a group of alum, uh, alumni that are, that are pushing for it. Chicago can throw these surprises at you, South Side especially. This is one of my favorites. This is, um, this is Auburn Lake, and um, this is just north of 79th Street between the Rock Island Metro Tracks, raised Rock Island Metro Tracks on the west and Vincennes Avenue on the east. And it's just a pleasant, Look at that, and it's great to see in the fall. Come back and look. if you go go check this out. Go check it out when the leaves turn because it's absolutely beautiful. There's a two block long lagoon that built in the 1880s that that runs down this street east to west, and these kind of post Victorian, um, moderate to mid to mid sized post Victorian houses around the edges. Uh, this was developed in 1888 as a, kind of a kind of a suburb, but then gets annexed by the city and then falls in, into decay. Uh, almost immediately, by the, by the 30s and 40s, you can see old daily news stories about people complaining, what happened to our idyllic spot? So this decay continues. When I was a young crime reporter uh, around town in the very late 80s and, and early 90s, every spring, there was either um, a car or a body that somebody fished out of this thing. The neighbors, though, said, you know what, this thing can be better. And with the alderman's help and, you know, and with other actors in the Auburn Gresham Chatham neighborhood, like uh, Father Flager, they got the park district to restore this place. And, you know, here it is 20 years ago. It still looks great. It's still an asset for the neighborhood. Uh, you can look to the left, to the right here. You can see a man with a fishing pole. He's fishing in here because the park district stocks it with a variety of fish. And, um, you know, it's really been a, been a, been a fantastic center for the for the area that building i don't talk about this in the book but that building you see the gentleman standing to the left and then behind them is kind of an old building i said that's a church building that is um from 1880s um mount hernan i think it is or herndon uh, i really need to do some research on that because uh you know it's you know around this place not only do they put houses uh they put this church there's also a hospital here at one point they get demolished in the in the 80s uh, you know, when it went out of business, but so there was some thought taken to what this place was going to be and how it was going to affect the rest of the South Side. Uh, as we get toward that, toward the end of our picture show, this is a house that's that's actually designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. It's a it's a relatively early Wright house, 1900. It's the uh, Foster, named after Stephen Foster, who was an attorney, not the guy who wrote Camptown Races or anything. And um, it was his summer home. And it's at 121st and Harvard uh, and the West Pullman community on the edge, southern edge of the city. And um, just a nice piece of art. Look at all the land that it sits on. So there's the house. And then behind the house uh, is a actual a stable, uh, former horse stable that's about the size of a Chicago bungalow. And, um, and, and there is there just a great, if you look to the left, to the extreme left, down the row of hedges to the left, there's a, there's a gate to the house, still original, uh, has these same uh, Japanese influences that the house does because uh, Wright was in, was in that period, that Tokyo period period at the time. And, and, the, and the gate is still there. Uh, we go inside and, um, you know, it's, 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 a great, it's a great staircase. I, I want to pull up the carpeting like I'm sure you do. Uh, and uh, but I want to come down those stairs with a tuxedo, right? And let everybody know that that I'm here. Um, dig the old push button electric lights to the, to, the, to the left there as well. The deal with this house is that it, has been for, it, it was for sale for 1,100 days, um, listing as, at, at one point at 250,000, and then at one point as little as 175,000. Couldn't find a buyer. Um, they dropped the price in April to 145,000, and they found a buyer. The house has been um, under contingent um, since then, I don't know, hopefully the deal will happen. But the problem is, is that banks, and this is the economic violence I talked about in the kind of prelude, in a neighborhood like West Pullman, where houses are foreclosed on and um, the, the, the housing market is depressed price-wise, 
Um, a house at $175,000 is a bit of an outlier. Less so at 145, but you really need a buyer who can come in and begin to restore the house, uh, which means that the, at one point, you're gonna be almost immediately upside down in the loan. The house is gonna be immediately worth less than the money it takes to acquire it and, and fix it up. And uh, as a result, that makes the deal harder to do. And that's the story for much of the South Side. We tend to think of these places wrongly. We've been taught wrongly to think of these places um, as the condition of them, often as the fault of the people who live there. And we absolve the banking industry, the lending industry, the appraisal industry uh, for the part that they play in undervaluing these, these lands. I used to live in Beverly, and as I dealt, people, used to tell people, uh, when I needed a roof for the house, it was no problem going to a bank to, to get five figures uh, to, to give me a new roof. But that same roof in Inglewood and a same size house in Inglewood would still be the same price. Uh, but the bank is gonna it's gonna it's gonna shuffle their feet a little bit before they loan me thirty thousand dollars on a house that might be worth sixty thousand just to fix the roof. So it's that economic issue that has to be dealt with and remember. This is 112th in Champlain. This is the Pullman neighborhood. This is the historic Pullman neighborhood. One of my favorite places. I used to live in the building that we're standing in front of, that we're underneath right now with this photograph. But there are four of these buildings that uh, frame a court uh, at, a, at 112th Street, built in um, the 1880s. Uh, actually, maybe, maybe these are a little bit later. Maybe these may be, maybe, maybe 1891 or two. Um, apartments then, still apartments now, uh, designed by Salon Beeman, who was the town architect when Pullman, this historic neighborhood, was the town that George Pullman, the railroad car manufacturer, built uh, uh, so he could build his railroad cars and get rich. So he built the factory to the to the north of where we're standing at 111th and Cottage Grove. And then he built a town for the workers to live in and rent from him from. And of course, the Great Pullman strikes that broke this up uh, largely was because of the recession of the that happened around uh, 1888, 1889. He depressed wages, but not rent. So he, the people caught in the vice there and and. Uh, you can imagine what happens next. But this remnant is still there, still occupied, very beautiful. Um, you can see a little peak of a building on the left, on the right there, uh, with an arch kind of, you know, between where we're standing and the, the far apartment. That's Market Hall. At the time, it's a, it's, it, there's no use in there now. It's, there was a fire there, so it's just kind of a, a hulk, an empty remnant there. But um, the word is, at the time of the Pullman strike, this, well, the market hall was, was like a it was it was like a a market where they sold you know fruit and vegetables and that, and that kind of thing bread that kind of thing, and the neighborhood folklore according to it at least is that one of the operators inside of market hall was Ness Bakery, and these were the parents of Elliot Ness, uh, the the treasury agent uh, of lore. The Nesses didn't live far from here. Ness went to Fenger High School, which is not too far to the west from here, and the story is is that during the Pullman strikes, the Nesses used their bakery to feed the workers for free. Um, but just, just the kind of the, you know, marriage of architecture and, and history and all that kind of stuff that places like this afford. And, and then when they're gone, uh, that history is harder to interpret, it's harder to point out uh, uh, in many cases. This is another Pullman house. Every, every market hall apartment, every four of these, uh, I mean, every one of these is paired with this great, with one of these great duplexes. Look at this building, you know, brick, uh, building, look at those limestone arches, right? You know, one family lives to the left, one family lives to the right. You can see the further right uh, piece of the Market Hall apartment next to it. Just a great piece of humane architecture that, um, you know, uh, the, the, the neighbors who live here, the residents who live here fought to save this community in the 1970s from an effort that was going to demolish it for an industrial park, which of course we know would be vacant now. And uh, they, they got landmark status for it, ultimately, um, National Register status for it. And that history, that work pay, continues to pay off. Uh, it is now a national monument, the old factory, which is, I don't think it's in the book. It's mentioned in the book, but I don't think I photographed it. The old Pullman factory, which is a beautiful piece of architecture, um, is going to be a, a visitor center uh, run by the National Park Service. We've got tours coming in out of the neighborhood all the time, particularly before the virus. But, you know, it just great. And this is, you know, you would go down 111th Street for years and may ne never notice this uh, And if you don't make a, make a turn south and check out the neighborhood that's there. 
very quickly, this is the Levisario, Levisario Youth Center at 76 in Parnell. Um, this is designed by Jeannie Gang, who is our, you know, our celebrated young architect of the day who designed Wanda Tower, which is being um, completed now. And of course, Vista Tower, I'm sorry, Vista Tower it used to be Wanda Tower, who designed Vista Tower, which is being completed now in Aqua Tower uh, as well downtown. At the time Aqua Tower was being completed, she completed this clever little building for just a couple million dollars, daycare center, which is part of the SOS Children's Village, which is behind me. You can see the buildings reflected in the glass behind me. And you know, the, everything that I said about uh, community centers being built to look like miserable places in, in, in poorer neighborhoods and in black neighborhoods, black and brown neighborhoods, the same thing can be said of many cases of daycare centers, child care centers, also, you know, sm you know, you know, tight little buildings that, you know, that perform a great service, but the architecture doesn't really, doesn't really respect, give the respect to that service that's needed. This one does. So, you know, these, you know, these lifts, these great lifts of uh, colored concrete, right? Give the building some, some, some drama, some, some playfulness, big giant, uh, you know, crazy window there inside, you see those stairs with wide um, steps, very wide, you know, they're wide in width, wide in depth, so the kids can play on them and, and classes can, you know, meet there and their play leaders can kind of show them things on the steps. Just a great, great piece of architecture in the neighborhood that needs and requires the architecture. And, and, you know, and again, I want to, I mean, I don't want to be patronizing when I say this, but, you know, look at the condition of these buildings. These, some of these buildings have been there. Whoops. Sorry. I think I hit the wrong button here. Hold on. Hold on, hold on. Here we go. Uh, you know, some of, these, some of these buildings have been standing for more than a few years. There's no graffiti, there's no vandalism, there's no, uh, none of that. And it's just, you know, when you build a building that's respectful to the residents, the residents respect it back. Lastly, this is a, um, a bridge over Lakeshore Drive um, at 40th Street, um, just completed in the last two years uh, by, um, Cordigan and Clark Associates and I think EXP, an engineering firm, that links the Bronzeville neighborhood to the lakefront. One of the inequities over the years has been the neighborhoods north of, uh, north of Hyde Park and south of the southern edge of downtown, which is, you know, three miles or more of neighborhoods, had very little access to the lake. And this is the best part of the lake on top of that as well. But the black neighborhoods to the east, there, there are only a couple of rickety bridges that led you across. And um, starting back under Daly, the idea was really executed under Rahm Emanuel, and there's going to be at least one executed under uh, Lori Lightfoot. Um, the city has built these great bridges to span Lakeshore Drive and, of course, the metro tracks that are just below me where I'm standing. Uh, and it kind of, you know, to kind of address that inequity, stitch these neighborhoods uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the beautiful lake. And just to give you an example of how far that is, this bridge is 1,400 feet and some change. It is, as, it is as long as the Sears Tower is. If you were to lay that thing down across, you know, the, the streets and the railroad tracks and walk, and walk across it, that's how long this bridge is. But what a great um, bridge. I mean, that's, that kind of Chicago blue, um, the, uh, the, the, the cables, the uh, stays that they tie it all together. Uh, just a great muscular bridge that looks pretty good. So with that, um, I will cut the screen share and um, we can we can we can we can talk a bit. Um, you want to jump on and just say uh, you see in the chat. Okay. Um, so if anybody um, has any questions, feel Oh yeah, it looks like there are a few questions in the chat. And if anybody has any questions or comments, go ahead and post them in the chat. And I guess just make sure that uh, it says uh, to, to all panelists and attendees, so everybody can see. So- uh, You wanna read them or should I read them? Or how do you wanna, how do you wanna do it? Uh, well, there's the first one says, is Gotham Greens, or, or hold on. Who is the architect for the bank? Oh, uh, okay. Um, I'm going to, I'm, it's in the book. I'm going to get the name wrong because I always do, but it's the, the bank builders and construction company. I, and, I, and I got that 90% right. Uh, it's an outfit out of St. Louis and they would design 
a bank and build it for you. And, it's, and you know, and not a lot has been, a whole lot has been written about this, but um, if many of you, if you're from Beverly, um, you might remember the old Chesterfield Bank at 108th and Western. That was when it's been badly altered now, but that was one. But these kind of modernist banks pop up around the country. And, and oftentimes they're done by this outfit and they borrow whatever's kind of hot from the day, right? And uh, architecturally, and they incorporate it in the bank. Uh, but, you know, very, very clever. They, you know, they, they, there's a couple on the north side. I'm trying to think if there's one that I can think of that might be out near Westchester, but, but that's the architect of the bank. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's some other ones here. Uh, let's see. What are the boundaries for the south side that you were describing? Barbara asked that. Well, the, the book describes the South Side as roughly um, Cermak to the north, the city boundaries, the Calumet River to the south, um, the lake to the east, and the western boundary, you know, dances around a bit. So, um, you know, at sometimes it's, um, you know, it's, it's Ashland, it's western. It's, I mean, well, sometimes it's western, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's Harlem. So the, so the western boundary is kind of, kind of jagged, but this is the, um, the, uh, the 185, 186 square mile area that the book talks about. Okay. All right. Um, then we have one that says, is Gotham Greens near the soap factory uh, that you showed us? It, it, it is. In fact, um, right after I took that photograph, I think they put, um, I think they put more growing um, uh, facilities on the roof of the building on the roof of the um, method building uh, in order to expand the Gotham Greens enterprise that, that's already there uh, on site. So yeah, yeah, very close by their neighbors. Okay. And then, uh, okay, it looks like you got a couple more there. It may be easier at this point if you wanna, uh, if you wanna um, read the questions in the chat. Um, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Bethany is asking, have any of these significant buildings appeared on the Chicago Architectural Open House? In addition to you, who's advocated for the preservation and popularizing of these buildings? The answer um, to the first question, if the buildings have been on uh, open, open House Chicago, I think it's Open House Chicago, by the Chicago Architecture Center now, um, I'm thinking of the, of the ones that are in the book. They, there, there's the, the, the um, Open House Chicago gets a shout out in the book because it's one of the few things that, that recent years have brought people to the South and West sides to enjoy the architecture. So I may have, I'm trying to think, when I, the year I wrote the book, is there anything that was there that was in the book? Maybe, oh, First Church of Deliverance, which, is, which I didn't show you, which is, but it's in the book. Um, so there are a couple of churches in the book that, that, that are there, uh, but yeah, and, and, and so in addition to you, who's advocating for the preservation and popularizing of these buildings, well, first of all, the people who live there on the south side want to see these buildings saved and preserved. We saw that most recently with uh, the city uh, taking a step to landmark the Emmett Till um, uh, house in, in, uh, in Woodlawn. So the people who live there are the first line in advocating for the preservation and popularizing of these buildings, but also Landmarks Illinois, uh, uh, the nonprofits and Preservation in Chicago especially uh, have, been, have been pushing, pushing for this. And, and, and for modernist buildings, there's a group called Docomomo. It's, it's the, um, it, 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 and Docomomo is kind of portmanteau. It's something like the documentation, DO, and conservation, CO, of buildings of the modernist movement. That's the Momo, Docomomo, right? And they're a national, international group that has a local chapter here. And they like these modern buildings, these 1950s buildings, and they've been really kind of pushing for the preservation of those as well. Um, Tim Noonan asks, are there any architecturally significant buildings in the Beverly Morgan Park, Mount Greenwood area? Mount Greenwood, not, not much, but Beverly Morgan Park, yes. And you know, uh, I didn't include those in the book as well as Hyde Park, because those are the few buildings on the south side that aren't overlooked. So if the criteria is overlooked buildings, Beverly and Mount Greenwood, although, I mean, Beverly and Oak Park aren't overlooked, but they're a ton. I mean, just to give you a quick, I mean, Tim may be from Beverly, but uh, it's, it's, it's worth the drive, however far you go, have to go to get there, just to drive down Longwood uh, Boulevard in Beverly from 90, I guess 95th to 111th Street, 
uh, on a glacial ridge, beautiful architecture, including a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Uh, let's see, fascinating talk. Can you discuss the significance and future of South Side's vernacular architectures? Well, this is really the, I'm sorry, let me read that so everyone can understand what I'm saying. Can you, uh, could you discuss the significance of, the significance of and future of the South Side's vernacular architectures, plural? You know, this is really um, the next, part of the next wave of architectural preservation in uh, across the city um, are, are these houses that are in places that may not be, you know, designed by Louis Sullivan or Frank Lloyd Wright, may not have a significant person who, um, yeah, who owned it, may not necessarily, in a city that breaks ground architecturally, may not necessarily rise to the level of some of those buildings, but are interesting buildings, you know, worker cottages, um, the bungalow has been, lift, has been lifted up. Um, and I think, you know, kind of parsing through those buildings and figuring out the best of the best and saving them is, is, is the next step. Uh, did you consider historic, the historic building at Exchange and 71st and Jeffrey? It is now by a golf course. I think it's called the South Shore. Oh, the South Shore Country Club. Yeah, well, yeah, it was the South Shore Country Club. I think, I think we mentioned it in the book, but again, uh, the South Shore Cultural Center by, um, I want to say, as, as Marshall and Fox, that building does get attention, right? It's right there in the lake at 71st Street. It was originally a, a restricted country club and it was bought by the Park District in 1973 and fixed up. It's kept in decent condition, but, you know, but, there's a, but you're right, there's a golf course. It's a magnificent kind of Mediterranean, I guess, building. If you know the Blues Brothers, uh, the, uh, their finale was there uh, in the movie. Uh, except the building was painted white at the time. It's kind of like a terracotta color now. Uh, what is it? Andrea wants to know, Andrea Taylor wants to know, what is the criteria for a building to be preserved? Well, you know, if you mean um, landmarked, uh, it usually has to um, fall under or, or any number of, I think, six or seven criteria. Um, uh, you know, distinctive architecture, you know, notable architect, uh, notable person who lived, you know, who lived there, notable event that happened there or that is tied to, um, and, you know, and that's that, that be, you know, any, all, any one of them or all uh, kind of become the lever to get a building landmarked. Um, the hard answer to your question is money, the criteria, for, the possession of money to have a building preserved. The, the, the other criteria is, is to be able to possess or amass the money often to, uh, to restore a building, which sometimes is hard. Uh, is there a movement to landmark the Pride Building, Pride Cleaners? Not a movement, but but there's interest, and the city's landmarks department is looking at it. Um, Bethany says, you mentioned there was a group of alum of Chicago Vocational who's working on landmark status. What kind of progress are they making, and are they looking for other uses for the buildings? The school is stunning and needs to be preserved. I agree. I, I think... Um, I, you know, the last I heard from this group, they were beginning to get a designation uh, report together. Uh, the, the city doesn't really have the manpower or the person power anymore as it used to, to send the staff out to create these reports. So a lot of them are generated by individuals. The Emmett Till House was like this. Preservation Chicago wrote the, the designation report, essentially, uh, that got the house placed on um, the preliminary landmark status now. And I think the CBS is undergoing a similar thing. I should check in and, and see what's happening with it. It is a stunning building. And, you know, um, you know it, can, it, can, it can live as a school. I mean, there's enough industry that's slowly beginning to come back to the Calumet area uh, with the factories I showed you and other things happening around Lake Calumet and the harbor that I could see a plan for the school in a few years uh, where it could kind of almost resume in a modern sense uh, what, it used to, what it used to do. Um, Cheryl, I guess this is for you, Patrick. Cheryl Brown wants to know if there, if this, if it'll be recorded because she missed the beginning. Oh yeah, it'll be. Uh, we'll share this on our YouTube page. Um, we talked about that yesterday, so yeah, you'll be able to see this in its entirety uh, pretty soon, in the coming days. Excellent, excellent. Yep. Uh, Ryan Flores asks, as you wrote the book and decided what to include, did you discover buildings that you didn't already know about? Yeah, there, there was one, uh, well, there's at least one 
that, and I just ran out of time. I ran out of time before I could photograph it. But at the back of the book, there's a, there's a reference to an architect that I meet while I'm hanging out with a buddy of mine. And he sees my camera and, and I, we talk about the book I'm writing. And uh, he's a black architect from, from Beverly. And um, I name him in the book. And he says, um, you know, go check out my church that I did at 111th and I think Loomis, 112th and Loomis. I went to check it out. And gosh, I wish I had time then to have included it in the book. I, I mentioned that conversation in the book, but I don't, I didn't get a chance to photograph the building. But it's a great, um, you know, I guess 1960s church. You would think it was the work of Harry Weiss uh, or, 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 Era or Elio Saarinen. I mean, it's a very clever book, church that sits on the on the block at a sits on the lot at a forty five degree angle. Um, that's one. Most of the buildings that I found were buildings that I knew about because I'm you know I've, I've been riding the streets for most of my life over here. Um, one building that I wish another one when I wish I included was um, a church in Inglewood that's on Sixty Sixth Street. I always get the name wrong. I think it's Saint Benedict the African. Email me and I'll, and I'll, and I'll get you. But, but that's one that I glimpsed once, saw it while riding around and thought, I want to put this in a book. But so if there's a part two, it'll go in there. And I guess there's a Facebook question. Do you happen to know what is happening with the Avalon Theater on 79th? One of my all time favorite buildings. Go inside during Open House Chicago a few years. It's amazing. It really is. That, the, the, the Avalon Theater, which would spend some time as the new Regal Theater uh, at 79th in South Chicago. Beautiful Moorish inspired building. The, the, the outside is in trouble, but the inside is, as Ryan says, is absolutely fantastic. It's kind of um, uh, fantasy, Moorish fantasy, kind of atmospheric building that, that we built and we built great theaters in town. Uh, I think the, the young man who owns it is still trying to get, get, get together the capital to, uh, to fix it up. And I wish him luck. I mean, you know, um, it's, I think it's a landmark, so it can't be demolished, but, you know, it, it, can, it can fall in if, if um, we don't get resources there. Uh, and, and Tim corrects me, that is the name, St. Benedict the African Catholic Church over on 66th Street and in England. I think that's all the questions I've got so far. Okay. Um, uh, I have a question for you. Was there yeah. any, uh, is there any special um, significance to the, like the color scheme and the exterior of the uh, was it the Comer Youth Center? How the one side was, it was really interesting. Uh, I was just curious about that. That's a good question. You know, and one, you know, John Ronan, the architect and I are friends and we've talked about this building a million times and we've never talked about the choice of color, hmm. why, why that was there. Um, maybe it was the color of the South Shore Drill Team that was the, one of the original people, the uh, entities that the building was built for. Um, but I'm not sure. Don't hold me to that. And John, if you're watching, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, but yeah, but it, it is spectacular. I mean, the use of red, it's almost red, white, and blue uh, yeah. in, in a way. Uh, but uh, but it really brings the building to life. Okay. Well, um, that was great. Um, I just want to remind everybody that uh, you know to do the uh, the survey to qualify for the raffle. It looks like we have uh, at least a dozen people have already. Uh, completed it and for those who are, are not lucky winners uh, in the raffle uh, they're able to go to your website right leebay.com yeah and you can um, and there's a link there that takes you to Northwestern uh, where if you want to buy the book you can or if you just want to look at some of the pictures that are in the book uh, there's room to do that on the website on the on the website as well okay all right, um, Ryan just uh, posted the link to the uh, raffle survey again. So, um, okay, but uh, I want to thank uh, Lee for um, taking time out of his busy schedule to do this presentation with us tonight. And I want to thank everybody who joined us uh, over thank Zoom you. and over Facebook Live, and it will be on YouTube in the coming days. All right, all right, good to be here. Thanks so much, right. thanks for the great questions, everybody. Yeah, all right, thank you. Have a great, have a great evening, everybody. All right. Take care. All right. You too.